Do you have patience? Delegate? Institutions? Honorable institutions? I offer you the greetings of our president, Miss Anna Maria Marzenta, who uh, uh, was great joy. Sorry, Jeff. I offer to you uh, all the greetings of our president, Miss Anna Maria Marzenta, who with great joy has entrusted the person affected by DKU the role of opening this year's conference. Something that in uh, the very beginning of our journey would have been unthinkable. I'm a chair of the Scientific Advisory Committee of the ESPDU and um, Alliance Disorders, so disorders treated in a way PQEs. And um, I have the honor to be also the lead of the uh, working group who has published already two papers on the first European PQ guidelines. Those arrived last year and they were very important for both getting the same treatment in every corner of Europe. It's not there, but we can come with guidelines and that way we will achieve some time, some way, um, the same treatment in uh, all of Europe. But it also stimulates discussion on many issues of our treatment and care. So I'm proud. I'm proud because of it, of, that we achieved something. Thank you. And um, because of the publications and because we already started yesterday with the second round of the European guidelines on PQ. And why am I so proud of that? You have the obligation, when you achieve guidelines, to publish every five years a new edition of it, to see whether something has changed. And that's not that easy, for when you have finished guidelines, you will say, good luck, I'm ready. But now you have to go on. Thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, while well, I was asking myself why I was why was I invited, and Maria already mentioned it a little bit, I was thinking over and uh, I still think you all sit here because you know that phenylalanine uh, uh, PKU still is a problem today. And I, I listened to my the first speakers here, and in the I think one of the first sentences here, I think it was Nico Constantinos who mentioned was looking for something new, looking for the cure in PKU. And if I talk to you, I will not give you the cure, no, not at all. I, actually, I will bring you some impressions that this will not be the cure, but I will present to you. But maybe new ways, uh, examples of other metabolic diseases that are quite similar than PQ, that go other ways, that might influence each other. And I will uh, talk about uh, trans liver transplantation in MSUD, which is maple syrup urine disease, and as an example for other metabolic diseases. And the question is, uh, is this, uh, can this be done in PKU? Summing that up, looking for transplantation is like looking for risks and benefits of such a step. On one side we have the benefits, uh, liver transplantation means there is no more risk of metabolic decompensations, no acute risks, acute decompensations, no chronic brain injury for, from non-compliance with the diet, from having too high values by following the diet. The great benefit is no dietary restrictions anymore, no potential nutritional deficiencies from taking a diet for life, no necessity to eat supplements and overall better quality of life, more independence, less anxiety, which is a special role in MSUD with the acute crisis. You have like a pain in the neck every day. You don't know, do you go to ICU? Do you go to dialysis during the next day to the next week? You never know that. On the other side, there are a number of risks in transplantation. There is the risk of operation. Actually, this is rather small. There is almost no patient today that 
dies during operation, but there are complications from surgery, from wild drainage, from blood vessels, from infections. There are rejections of the new liver. There's the acute rejections that can be cured very good today, and there is much improvement today uh, treating rejection of a new liver. But improving this situation, you also have side effects from the medication. You have side effects from, immuno from the immunosuppressive medication, like you can get chronic renal problems, and still we also tell all our patients that there is a small risk of malignancy over lifetime if you do transplantation and need immune suppression over time. And if you think about LTX and MSUD and transfer this to LTX and PQU, you also have to see what is the benefit and what is the risk, and maybe you will get different results on this balance if you look at PKU in this situation. I'm quite convinced that if you look in MSUD, the balance goes more to the right side today on this side compared to the more conventional way with a diet and with a conventional approach. If I sum this up and give you some take home message, I would say that due to better surgical techniques and improved immunosuppression, pediatric liver transplantation is no more restricted to end-stage liver disease, but also applied with a calculable risk to metabolic disorders. I would say, I believe that, I really believe that in MSUD patients with severe neonatal metabolic decompensation and we have two patients now on the ward from Eastern Germany that are trans were just transplanted. That liver transplantation in our hands is the method of choice for these small patients because in the long run the, the prognosis for these young patients on a statistical way is better and it outweighs the statistical risks in these patients. For other MSUD patients, the decision pro or con a liver transplantation has to be made on a very, very individual basis. That means how much is the diet a problem? How much do you reach a good metabolic control in your individual patient? What is your psychological background? And the big problem that we see is that the patients with the most psychological problems think that liver, prop, that liver transplantation is the solution for their problems. This, I would say, I can confirm that this is not a solution because you change one disease with another one, a milder one, a more chronic one, but you will not be healthy after liver transplantation in the sense that you don't have to take medication, you still have to do blood control and things like that. PKU could theoretically be cured by LTX, this I showed you in the beginning, however, assessing benefits and risks in PKU treatment, liver transplantation will not be a realistic option for PKU patients today. Maybe there are new developments in the future, new techniques, maybe we do not talk about whole organ transplantation, maybe we talk about cell transplantation, about genetic mechanisms, I think there are things on the horizon that might be very interesting. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I would like to wish you a nice stay here in Venice.
Sticks from Romania. So now we come, Nico, you're, you've got something to do now. You've got to give the flag over to who we are, where we're having the um, conference set. Oh, yeah. So it's already on Facebook where we're going for the next five years. <laughs> so you can stand over on my left. It's going to be a really quick 30 seconds, and then I'm going to do a summary, okay? So Nico, if you want to stand there. Which one do you want to stand <laughs> Nico, just stand there. Next year, the country that will be hosting the ESPK conference will be Turkey. Denise, all, all Photo session, 30 seconds, quickly. <laughs> I've got the one for the flag one, haven't I? That's all right, it's bigger. Okay, so uh, next year we get, uh, we've, uh, I know telephone conversations have already been made by Denise, so uh, we're, we're on the way. Oh, andiamo to Turkey. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so what's happening? We know there are going to be a lot of new therapies in the pipeline. Some are going to be cheap, some are going to be expensive. I know one company raised 70 million dollars just like that on the market. When? They've got to get the efficacy. They've got to get approval. How far away is it? We know PayPal has been approved by the FDA in America. And we know that an application has gone into the European Medicines Agency for the EU. That will be January, February next year. Then, countries, unfortunately, have to consider the cost because the EU don't consider the cost, it's the individual country. Okay, cost, not a problem. But what's the hurdles? One of the major hurdles, which is why we had a discussion about this in our delegates meeting yesterday is, is a health technology assessment. I'll give you two in plain English because I'm a financial god. It's a cost-benefit analysis that takes into account a lot of things. Tangible costs, intangible costs, direct costs, indirect costs. That's going to be a barrier. We know it's a barrier in the UK for a, a little thing that we're trying to do at the moment. It's a barrier in Ireland, they've had to put up with it. It's a barrier in Poland, it's a barrier in a lot of EU countries. But health technology assessments are going to come to a country near you, to your country. So you need to be prepared for it and you need to talk to your associations so that they understand it and get a foot in to make sure that they can influence policy makers and decision makers and who spends the money. So that is the biggest hurdle that you're going to face going forward. I hate saying going forward. I think it's going forward. Okay. The next thing, very quickly, food labeling. Absolute disgrace. Absolute disgrace. In Europe, I'm getting nods to the dietitians in the audience. In Europe, it's a problem because you can get protein labeled as. A product could have a labelling that states that the protein content is 0.5 mils per burn. What's that? 0 0.4? 0 0.2? 0 0.1? 0? What does it mean? What does it mean? In the US, it's one gram. That's even worse. And we get products coming in from America. One gram. What's going on? What are we doing about it? One milligram. Did I? <laughs> yeah. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. So there's another thing that we in the ESPK need to pick up and challenge the Food Standards Agency in the EU and in your country. Because you don't know if you've got a product that says less than one milligram per hundred grams, how much are you getting? Point five? Point seven? How many exchanges is that? Think about it. 
And finally, right, yeah, protein content is deemed not to be important because it doesn't kill anybody. Right, doesn't kill anybody. They're not interested. Ah, oh, PKU, unborn error metabolism, inborn error metabolism, hidden rare disease. Well, you don't die. There's a there's a there's a there's a therapy called diet. So what? And then you've got to start to advocate and explain and say, look, it may not kill people, but it's important to us. Remember that. I will see you next year in Turkey. Thank you.